Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Welcome to Policy and Rights, the show about human rights and government policy. Welcome back everyone to Policy and Rights here on Depictions Media Radio. I am Michael Cloggs, your host. <coughs> And uh, we have press re- briefings from the, the United Nations and, of course, the Pan American Health Organization. Um, Dr. Etienne um, of the director of um, the Pan American Health Organization, um, in her COVID uh, briefing, was talking about, uh, of course, cases are dropping across North America, and they're seeing... Um, hospitalizations in increase in Canada in eastern provinces and deaths increase in um, Mexico uh, COVID infections and deaths have gro- have gone down in most countries in Central America and South America uh, while most countries are seeing continued reductions in cases Bolivia Venezuela are reporting a rise in new infections but this isn't quite the same the the case for the Caribbean, and she um, was reporting that in the, the Dominican Republic and Barbados, um, new cases over the last week. In fact, half of the Barbados cumulative COVID infections since the pandemic have be, been reported over the last month. Puerto Rico, Trinidad. It, um, and Tobago uh, and Martinique are seeing a jump in infections also. Um, so let's listen to what uh, Dr. Etienne has to say about that versus, of course, vaccinations and uh, country policies on those vaccinations. So let's listen to uh, the um Dr. Etienne and um, the Pan American Health Organization, PAHO. Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. And thank you for joining today's press briefing. Over the last week, there were nearly 817,000 new COVID infections and over 18,000 COVID-related deaths reported in the Americas. Cases are dropping across North America. Although we are seeing hospitalizations increase in Canada's eastern provinces and deaths increase in Mexico. COVID infections and deaths have gone down in most countries of Central America. In South America, while most countries are seeing continued reductions in cases and deaths, Bolivia and Venezuela are reporting a rise in new infections. However, the situation is more severe in the Caribbean. The Dominican Republic and Barbados are reporting over 40% jumps in new cases over the last week. In fact, half of Barbados's cumulative COVID infections since the pandemic began have been reported in the last month. Puerto Rico, Trinidad and Tobago and Martinique are also seeing a jump in new infections. And cases remain high in St. Martin, St. Kitts and Nevis, Anguilla and the Cayman Islands. So we continue to urge countries, especially those in the Caribbean, to maintain and prioritize public health measures to control the spread of COVID. 
These measures, along with widespread vaccinations, are the best option to control outbreaks. The good news is that 41% of people across Latin America and the Caribbean have been fully vaccinated, but this is not an even coverage. Some countries are higher and others are much lower. Another 4.6 million COVAX vaccine doses will reach our region by the end of this week, so more people can be protected. But even as vaccine coverage increases, we will continue to see new infections throughout our region. Today's COVID vaccines are very safe. They are also highly effective in preventing severe disease and death and can stop most infections. Like other vaccines, COVID-19 vaccines were designed to save lives and protect us from the virus's most serious symptoms. And they are clearly achieving that. However, we need to continue to track and manage infections closely to detect and minimize community transmission. So today, I want to spotlight surveillance efforts in our region. Surveillance has always been the eyes and ears to guide our COVID response from when the first case was detected in our region, as we navigated our pandemic peaks, and as we continue to track emerging variants. As we look to the future, surveillance and early warning, integral components of disease control will remain essential to identifying new risks and managing and responding to this next phase of the pandemic. To improve and evolve epidemic surveillance in the region, countries must act locally. They must act smarter and act together. More and more, we're seeing how local hotspots, so to speak, are driving national trends. And that's why health authorities should have a clear picture of what is happening at the local level and quickly communicate both the risks and the public health measures needed to reduce transmission. By empowering local institutions like laboratories, public health schools and universities to diagnose new infections locally as part of the national surveillance efforts, local municipalities can detect risk more quickly and remain on the pulse of emerging trends. Enhancing homegrown detection capacities also means ensuring that there are enough local testing sites and that clinicians know where, when, and which COVID tests are worth sending for epidemiological surveillance. To act smarter, countries should also look for ways to build on existing surveillance networks. By integrating COVID-19 with surveillance activities for other respiratory viruses like influenza, countries can monitor diseases more efficiently and sustainably. Today, together with the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, the CDC, PAHO is working to implement a new PCR-based multiplex protocol that would allow countries to simultaneously detect COVID-19 and influenza from the same sample. As countries work to become more self-sufficient in their pandemic response, this new integrated testing strategy will help countries sustain their surveillance efforts. Acting smart also means making the most of what the data tells us. And that's why PAHO has developed a modeling tool that tracks cases and forecasts short-term trends. This modeling tool helps countries measure the impact of different public health measures to inform their responses. Today, countries in the Caribbean, including Antigua and Barbuda, Barbados, Dominica, Grenada, St. Lucia, and St. Vincent and the Grenadines are leveraging these models 
to manage the ongoing outbreaks. And as the pandemic continues to evolve, we encourage countries to use this tool to design their responses and apply public health measures at the right time. Finally, we also want to see countries continue to act together to improve our regional surveillance. Thanks to the efforts of countries across the Americas, our region has built a robust and innovative surveillance network that enables us to keep a close eye on this virus and on the emergence and spread of COVID-19 variants. Building on the legacy of our region's long-standing influenza and other respiratory viruses surveillance and laboratory networks, we now have a robust network of 45 national public health labs, and, and that's growing, that runs COVID molecular tests from all over the America, standardizing laboratory protocols, conducting trainings, and donating more than 21 million COVID PCR tests and nearly 18 million rapid diagnostic tests to countries across our region. We must keep investing in and expanding this regional network. This platform helps us track COVID-19 cases and can be adapted to identify other viruses and other emerging pathogens, serving as the region's backbone for pandemic preparedness. On another note, this week marks 30 years since the last case of polio in the Americas. A boy named Luis Fermin Tenorio in Peru, who later became a polio volunteer. This extraordinary accomplishment was made possible by mass vaccination efforts and robust epidemiological surveillance that was underpinned by a strong network of laboratories. And our region was the first to do this. Even though our region has not seen a polio case due to wild polio virus in 30 years, all of our member states continue to monitor for polio and to vaccinate against the disease today so to, we can all be kept safe. As we recognize World Polio Day this Sunday, we are reminded of what this region can achieve when it works together to keep health threats in check, when we protect the most vulnerable and ensure that all people have access to life-saving vaccines. Voy a responder en inglés. Uh, uh, let, let me say that really we are pleased when we see cases and positivity rates falling in some countries because this means that we are getting closer to being able to control COVID-19 outbreaks. The most important steps that we can take are to track and manage infections closely. Remember we said even focusing at the local level to adjust the crucial public health and social measures accordingly and to increase the rate at which we are vaccinating our populations. Last week in my remarks, I, I outlined some of the scenarios that countries face depending on implementation of public health measures and vaccination coverage. As we stated then, the most desirable of these scenarios is that we see reduced hospitalization and deaths due to consistent public health and social measures on one hand and high vaccination coverage on the other. And we really hope to see this happen in more and more areas and countries. In some countries, we may see continued high rates of community transmission due to low vaccination coverage and insufficient public health and social measures. In our others, however, there could be periodic spikes in transmission when public health and social measures slip or if vaccine coverage dips. As we have reported to our governing bodies consisting of our member states, suppression of COVID-19 in the Americas will continue to require a comprehensive re response. 
um, will sustain health services network capacities, public health and social measures, targeted vaccination operations, and outbreak control actions, such as early detection, investigation, and isolation of cases, and tracing and quarantining of contacts. I think those you've heard us say this over and over again, certainly even today, this has been repeated several times. So public health and social measures must continue even where acceptable vaccination coverage exists. And continuous planning for responsive healthcare services delivery during COVID-19 surges remains critical for the medium and long-term control of the pandemic. Really, this is both an individual and collective responsibility. And national authorities also must play a role. But as we've said several times before, it is only together, each of us doing our part, that we are going to arrive at a point where um, COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2 is controlled in our region and beyond this um, globally. Thank you very much for joining us this um, this morning and may you have a wonderful day and rest of the week. Thank you. Now, um, moving uh, on to uh, the United Nations and what is being talked about on the, on, in, within the United Nations, um, a, of course, Israel and Palestine is always a one of those hot topics, and um, we're going to hear two two sides of 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 the story on this one. Um, one is going to be a little bit longer than, than the others, where um, they're discussing policing of the Gaza Strip and the policing of Palestinians and Muslims in within Israel and um, the second uh, piece is going to be much shorter um, discussing how the United Nations is just simply siding against Israel and that the debate is one-sided and people need to 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 see the side from the Israelis where they claim to be striving for peace and their efforts are failing because the debate is only going towards the Palestinians. So let's listen to those two pieces next. Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the Security Council. At the outset, I welcome the ongoing engagement between senior Israeli and Palestinian officials. I strongly encourage a further expansion of such efforts which can improve conditions on the ground and pave the way towards the reinvigorating of the peace process. But we should have no illusions about the current state of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The situation in the occupied Palestinian territory continues to deteriorate and we have seen no progress towards realizing a two-state solution. This political stagnation is fueling tension, instability and a deepening sense of hopelessness. The security situation in Gaza remains fragile and security dynamics in the occupied West Bank, including East Jerusalem, are deteriorating, including growing tensions in and around the holy sites. Settlement activity, evictions, demolitions and seizure of Palestinian property, ISF military operations, particularly in Area A, and movement and access restrictions, including the severe closure in Gaza, further feed the cycle of violence. A large number of Palestinians, including children, continue to be killed and injured by Israeli security forces. 
settler-related attacks against Palestinians and their property, including in the presence of Israeli security forces, continue. Israeli civilians continue to be subjected to attacks by Palestinians that have caused deaths, injuries, and damages. Israeli and Palestinian civilians are suffering and paying the steep price for the persistence of the conflict, including the protracted occupation. In addition, the Palestinian Authority is facing an unprecedented fiscal and financial crisis, a strengthened PA and PA institutions are needed in order to implement necessary reforms and eventually return to Gaza. I am concerned that these negative trends are occurring simultaneously across the West Bank and Gaza and should not be left unaddressed. Mr. President, daily violence continued throughout the occupied Palestinian territory during the reported period. In Gaza, while a relative calm largely prevailed, on 30 September a Palestinian man was killed by ISF as he approached the perimeter fence. The Israeli Defense Forces said that the man approached the fence in the central Gaza Strip with two other men carrying a suspicious bag and digging in the ground. Relatives of the man disputed the account, saying he was hunting birds. In the occupied West Bank, including East Jerusalem, clashes, attacks, search and arrest operation and other incidents resulted in the death of three Palestinians and injuries from live fire and rubber-coated metal bullets to 66 Palestinians, including nine children and one woman. Four Israeli civilians and two soldiers were injured in course of these events. On 30 September, a Palestinian woman was shot and killed by ISF after reportedly attempting to stab ISF officers in Jerusalem's old city. In the same day, ISF shot and killed a Palestinian man in the village of Burkin near uh, Jenin. According to ISF, the man had opened fire at Israeli troops as they were conducting an arrest operation. Palestinian Islamic Jihad later claimed the man was one of their members. On 14 October, ISF shot and killed a 14-year-old Palestinian and wounded another while they were allegedly throwing Molotov cocktails at civilian vehicles west of Bethlehem. The same day, a Palestinian man drove his vehicle into and injured an IDF soldier near Kalandia checkpoint. Israeli forces fired on the vehicle and injured and arrested the driver. In addition, since 8 October, we have witnessed nearly nightly clashes between Palestinians and Israeli civilians, as well as Israeli security forces in and around the old city. Meanwhile, settlers and other Israeli civilians perpetrated 26 attacks against Palestinians, resulting in 18 injuries and damage to property. Palestinians perpetrated 31 attacks against Israeli settlers and other civilians in the West Bank, resulting in injuries in four cases and in damage to property in the rest. On 28 September, some 70 Israeli settlers attacked the Palestinian village of Um Mafakara, Rakez and Al Tuvani in the South Hebron Hills. The settlers injured nine Palestinians, including children, killed livestock and damaged vehicles and homes, as well as community infrastructure. A three year old Palestinian boy hit in the head while stone, uh, by stones as he slept was hospitalized with a skull fracture. In related clashes, 20 Palestinians were injured by Israeli defense forces. Palestinians also threw stones towards Israelis during the incident, injuring one soldier. On 29 September, Israeli Foreign Minister Yair Lapid condemned the attacks, tweeting, quote, this violent incident is horrific and it is terror, unquote. He called the perpetrators, quote, a violent and dangerous fringe, unquote, and said Israel had, quote, a responsibility to bring them to justice, unquote. ISF arrested at least six Israelis in relation to these incidences, including two children, as well as three Palestinians. The Palestinians 
and at least four Israelis have reportedly since been arrested and, and after that released. An investigation by Israeli authorities is ongoing. I welcome the swift condemnation of the attacks from the Israeli foreign minister and underscore that all perpetrators of violence must be held accountable and swiftly brought to justice. Since the annual olive harvest began a week ago, some 1,200 olive trees have reportedly been vandalized by settlers. On 15 October, some 40 settlers attacked Palestinian farmers east of Yasuf village, north of Salfit, injuring a Palestinian woman with pepper spray and three others by throwing stones. I call on Israel to take all necessary steps to fulfill its obligation to protect Palestinian civilians from violence, including by Israeli settlers, and to investigate and hold accountable those responsible for such attacks. Mr. President, on 4 and 18 October, the Israeli Civil Administration had a discussion on objections to two settlement housing plans for a totality of near 3,500 units in the strategic E1 area in the West Bank. I am concerned that the Israeli authorities continue to consider plans for constructions in E1. If constructed, these units would sever the connection between the northern and the southern West Bank, significantly undermining the chances for establishing a viable and contiguous Palestinian state as a part of the negotiated two-state solution. I reiterate that all settlements are illegal under international law and remain a substantial obstacle to peace. On 5 October, the Jerusalem Magistrate Court granted the appeal of a Jewish Israeli who was expelled from the Holy Esplanada for praying in violation of Israeli police reg uh, regulations that allow only Muslims to pray at the site. The court's decision was condemned as a violation of the status quo by the Palestinian, Egyptian and Jordanian governments, by Palestinian factions and by Muslim and Christian leaders in Jerusalem and throughout the region. The police appealed the decision to the Jerusalem District Court, which overturned the lower court decision and reinstated the appellant's temporary visitor ban on 8 October. In a statement released, the same day by Israeli's public security minister reiterated that the status quo must be observed, adding that any change to the existing arrangement would, quote, would endanger public safety and could cause a flare-up, end of quote. I welcome this statement by the Israeli minister and I reiterate that all sides must respect and uphold the status quo at the holy sites. Mr. President, Israeli demolitions and confiscation of Palestinian homes and other structures continued during the reporting period. Overall, Israeli authorities demolished, seized and forced owners to demolish 18 Palestinian-owned structures in Area C and 7 in the occupied East Jerusalem, displacing 5 Palestinians, including 3 women and 1 child. The demolitions were carried out due to the lack of Israeli issued building permits, which are nearly impossible for Palestinians to obtain. On 29 September, Israel's High Court of Justice granted a request by the State of Israel to postpone to March 2022. It responds to a petition to implement eviction orders against the Bedouin village of Khan al Ahmar in Area C of the West Bank. In its request, the government cited the COVID-19 pandemic and the current diplomatic security situation, adding that there had been significant progress towards an agreement that could avoid a demolition. On 4 October, Israel's Supreme Court presented a proposal to four Palestinian families facing evictions in the occupied East Jerusalem neighborhood of Jake Shara and to the Israeli settler corporation seeking to evict them. The proposals would significantly postpone eviction efforts while requiring the families to pay a nominal annual rent to the settler corporation.
The court specified that the agreement would in no way prejudge ongoing legal proceedings to determine ownership of the properties. If the parties do not reach an agreement by the 2nd of November, the court stated it will issue a ruling. I urge Israel to cease demolition and evictions in line with its obligation under the international humanitarian law. In a welcome development earlier today, Israeli and Palestinian officials announced that some 4,000 Palestinians living in the West Bank without proper documentation would be registered in the Palestinian Population Registry and receive identity documents. Mr. President, the PA's fiscal situation is reaching a breaking point. Expenditures far exceeded revenues and the gap is growing. Donor support, including direct budget support, continued its multi-year decline. Estimates suggest that the PA will have a 2021 budget deficit of around US dollar 800 million. This would nearly double the 2020-2020 gap and even with donor support and emergency measures we will have this situation to be continued. The borrowing capacity of the PA with the banks has been exhausted. Along with other long-standing fiscal leakages that are contributing to the financial crisis, Israel continues to deduct millions of US dollars per month from clearance revenue transfers in response to Palestinian payments to security prisoners, their families, and the families of those killed in the context, context of attacks. Israel's recent loan of 500 million shekels against future Palestinian revenue was critical, but only delays temporarily the looming crisis and does not address the structural impediments imposed on the Palestinian economy. Significant reforms and policy changes by both Israelis and Palestinians must be implemented to address the structural challenges. Such reforms could and should be met with increased support from the international donor community. This will form a key part of the upcoming agenda for the HLC meeting scheduled in Oslo in November. Mr. President, efforts continue to stabilize the situation in Gaza and support recovery and reconstruction following the May escalation. The UN has launched reconstruction efforts for severely damaged housing units. Preparations for additional reconstructions have begun with assistance from Qatar and after the lifting of some restrictions on the entry of construction materials by Israeli authorities. Up to 1,800 of the more than 2,000 destroyed and severely damaged homes will be rebuilt in the first phase. In addition, Egypt began repairing one of Gaza's main coastal roads in late September. During the months of September, nearly 7,000 truckloads of goods entered Gaza to the Israeli-controlled Karim Shalom crossing, some 80% of the pre-escalation's monthly average. About 2,000 truckloads entered through the Egyptian-controlled Rafah crossing, marking one of the highest recorded volumes of entering goods. In addition, as of 18 October, more than 6,000 permits were issued for Gaza merchants and traders to enter Israel, a critical contribution to boosting the local economy, which can be expanded. While I welcome the issuance of permits and improvements in the movement of goods into and out of the Strip, much more needed is, uh, is needed to facilitate sustainable access. I reiterate that the Gaza reconstruction mechanism remains best place to enable the entry of accountable delivery of items and materials that would otherwise not be allowed into the Strip. I remain concerned by UNRWA's continued budget shortfall and I welcome the recently announced contributions from key donors. However, UNRWA still lacks the necessary funds to sustain its critical programs 
for the rest of this year. UNRWA remains indispensable for foreign uh, regional stability and must have the necessary resources to fulfill its mandate. Mr. President, turning briefly to the region on the Golan, while the ceasefire between Israel and Syria has been generally maintained violation of the 1974 uh, disengagement of force agreement by the parties continue increasing tensions. Both parties' adherence to the terms of the disengagement agreement is important for preserving stability. In Lebanon, a new government was formed on 10 September by Prime Minister Najib Mikati, ending 13 months caretaker period. The 24 members government, which includes one woman minister, vote to reach an agreement with the International Monetary Fund tackling the energy crisis and to hold 2022 elections on time. The investigations into the Beirut port explosion face setbacks as a result of reporting Im intimidation of the judge and judge of the investigation. On 14 October, deadly clashes erupted in Beirut during a protest calling for his removing, removal. <clears throat> Mr. President, we can no longer lurch from crisis to crisis. Our approach cannot be to address the current situation piecemeal, incident by incident, on a short-term, day-to-day basis as stand-alone issues. A broader package of parallel steps by the government of Israel, the PA and the international community is needed. Such a framework should begin to address key political, security and economic challenges that are preventing progress. These efforts are urgently urgent and will require a clear political commitment and involvement from the government of Israel, from the PEA and from the international community. We must begin to restore hope in a peaceful, sustainable, negotiated resolution to the conflict. Despite the enormity of the current political, economic and humanitarian challenges, we cannot afford to be pessimistic or passive. I welcome the efforts of the envoys of the Middle East Quartet, including in the call held on 14 October. I encourage both parties to urgently implement positive and significant policy shifts to address the security situation, improve the Palestinian economy and strengthen the Palestinian governance and institutions. I also urge Israeli and Palestinian authorities to find additional avenues for cooperation, including on the implementation of existing agreement. This is not the end game, but rather key steps in that process that can and must lead us back to genuine negotiations and end the occupation and allow for a realization of a two-state solution on the basis of 1967 lines, international law, UN resolutions and previous agreements. We must build consensus in support of a broader framework for engagement of phase or phase or face an increasing desperate reality shaped by extremist voices and unilateral actions that will heighten the risk of Palestinians, Israelis and the regions to get into a more severe conflict. The UN, the UN is actively engaged in advancing these efforts, including to the Middle East Quartet, key regional partners and Israeli and Palestinian leaders. I thank you, Mr. President. I thank Mr. Wendersland for his briefing. Good morning. Every time that the Security Council gathers to debate the situation in the Middle East, the same story is constantly repeated. 
The entire focus of the discussion is only to bash Israel, and the one-sided anti-Israel rhetoric has turned these debates into a waste of everyone's time. Despite the Security Council duty to facilitate peace, some of its members make sure to help dig the ditch of conflict even deeper. The very fact that the Council invited today a lifelong spokesperson for the Palestinian political leadership to represent civil society just shows how flawed these debates have become. What's next? Will the Council invite Hassan Rouhani and Jawad Zarif as repre representatives of Iranian civil society? While polls shows, show that 80% of the Palestinian public are fed up with President Abbas's authoritarian regime, their leaders are still spreading the same lies and distortions at the UN. The platform given to the Palestinians at these biased debates create a false reality which only serves to strengthen Palestinian rejectionism of any further negotiations with Israel thereby maintaining the conflict. The only way for this council to advance peace in the region is to stop allowing the Palestinians to turn these debates into a platform for spreading their outrageous anti-Israel libels. Meanwhile, these debates almost entirely disregard the real threat to regional and global security, Iran. Iran, friends, has assembled six armies of terrorist proxies in the region, and by allowing the Ayatollah regime to continue with the severe violation of, the, of their international commitments, these six terror armies will soon have an Iranian nuclear umbrella. Allowing Iran to become even a threshold nuclear state poses an existential threat to Israel. Therefore, the State of Israel will never allow this to happen. Never. This month marks 30 years to the Madrid Conference, where Prime Minister Shamir described a peaceful Middle East as a paradise for culture, science, and creativity. Israel has always and will always remain committed to peace and the strong peace agreements with six of our neighbors can attest to that. Israel urges the Security Council to stand up to Iran and to demand that Palestinian leadership abandon their culture of hate. This is the only way to transform the region into a paradise of progress, prosperity, and peace. Thank you. Now we're going to talk about uh, Kenya and the Great Lakes uh, region and how um, things are actually going there. Of course, um, there are discussions about how um, resources are being just carried away from from Kenya and from and the money along with the, the these uh, resources are being carried away from the people who actually need to, need the money for for the region to help in things like poverty hunger in that particular region and also to help aid because as we we've also seen in other reports um, on our website at depictions media that um, the region is also being flooded because of heavy rains and um, overspills of the uh, Great Lakes. Some of this is due to, of course, to uh, to climate change and, or as, as we'd like to call it, uh, climate crisis, and how we need to do do things a little bit differently maybe a lot differently in order to um, help hold down uh, the rising temperatures and changes in in our weather weather patterns a lot of times we th we when we think of this it was originally labeled such a 
like global warming, but there's more to it than that. Um, that as the ice caps melt on our planet in the rising uh, sea levels, that there's more changes in weather weather patterns, more changes in um, in storms and how they're going to affect us. And uh, as we saw over the over the summer. Um, in the uh, Pacific North America that the firefighter fire fi wildfires happening and burning a lot of hectares of, of hectares of uh, forest and also in that particular area we're seeing things like slides mudslides and and other things as the rains come so we need to change some of this, and uh, that also is is what's also is affecting uh, the Great Lake regions in Kenya. So we're also going to hear uh, towards the end of this about uh, climate action and climate change that we might need to take care of along with that. So let's listen to uh, to those pieces now. Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I want to speak to you briefly in my national capacity. We have just concluded uh, the Security Council high-level debate on the Great Lakes region. The debate was Kenya's second high-level event and the first of two ministerial-level meetings that I'll be chairing during Kenya's presidency of the Council. We were privileged to receive insightful briefings by the special envoy of the Secretary General to the Great Lakes region, also from the Executive Secretary of the International Conference on the Great Lakes, and from the Assistant Secretary General for Africa, and we heard from a number of countries also from the Great Lakes region, namely uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, we heard from Angola, we heard from Rwanda, Burundi, and Uganda. The ministerial debate focused on ways to lawfully, transparently, and sustainably utilize the natural resources in the Great Lakes region to promote peace and sustainable development. We chose this focus area because the linkages between natural resources and conflict remains a key challenge for many of the Great Lakes countries in the Great Lakes region. It is our conviction that the region must proceed with courage and alacrity to harness its natural resources for the benefit of its people, especially its youth, so as to guarantee its peace and prosperity. There must be a shift away from the pattern of unregulated extraction and exploitation to a model that favors investment in people, investment in capacity building, value addition, job creation and infrastructure development, and I would also add cross-border trade. Natural resources must be extracted and traded in a transparent, accountable, and sustainable manner and utilized to drive positive change. I am happy to report that the Council commenced its consideration of today's agenda with the adoption of a presidential statement on the situation in the Great Lakes region after weeks of negotiation. My delegation thanks all members of the Security Council for their support and positive engagement that led to this landmark product. 
Through this presidential statement, the Security Council reinvigorates and renews its commitment to support the regional governments in seeking solutions to sustainably address the root causes and drivers of rampant conflict in the region with a special focus on positively harnessing the region's natural resources for social and economic transformation. Today, we have applauded the countries of the Great Lakes region for the commendable steps they have taken to consolidate peace and stability in the region. In particular, members welcomed the high-level regional diplomatic engagements that have, have, have seen improved bilateral relations and commend the work of the International Conference of the Great Lake, Lakes under the leadership of Angola in its endeavors to promote regional cooperation and constructive dialogue in the peaceful resolution of conflict. Today's debate and the presidential statement that was adopted reflect Kenya's commitment that Africa's natural resources should contribute to development and security and not division and war. To this end, the presidential statement bears major deliveries that include one, the imperative for a stronger, reinforced, reinvigorated, shared vision of peace, security, regional integration, and economic cooperation. Two, support for disarmament, demobilization, reintegration, repatriation, and resettlement programs as identified by the contact and coordination group. Three, addressing the linkage between illegal exploitation and trade in national resources and the illegal acquisition and trafficking of small arms and light weapons. And fourthly, to support resource endowed countries to transform the entire national resource extraction continuum from illegal exploitation to a legal productive use of natural resources that contributes to conflict prevention, resolution, and reconstruction. Let me confirm Kenya's commitment as a Great Lakes region country to continue working with regional mechanisms and the Security Council in supporting the transformation of our region through better management of our natural resources for our shared prosperity. I thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Minister. Michelle Nichols from Reuters. Uh, I wanted to ask you about uh, something happening in your region of the world, the airstrikes this week by the Ethiopian government in Tigray, which the UN says have killed and injured several civilians. What's your response to that, and do you have a message at all for the Ethiopian government and the parties on the ground? Well, our concern uh, with Tigray is that they ought to be uh, an immediate cessation of hostilities, that they ought to be national dialogue and reconciliation, reconciliation, and they ought to be a pathway to reducing human suffering and facilitating humanitarian access. This is the message that we um, have imparted to our neighbors in Ethiopia, and we are hopeful that there will be a cessation of hostilities as soon as possible. This is imperative. Thank you very much, Madam Minister. Uh, Edith Lettera from the Associated Press. Um, on the linkage between um, exploitation of minerals and conflict, um, we've heard these calls for many years for the armed groups to uh, stop exploitation but we haven't actually seen significant action on the ground that's halted this, um, these illegal actions. What more can be done to actually reverse this trend and ensure that the riches of a country go to its people and not to armed groups? Well, this is a multifaceted problem, and it is one that requires a multifaceted approach. 
What we are seeing now in the Great Lakes region is greater regional cooperation between countries, the thawing of diplomatic, uh, uh, of bilateral tensions, and a movement towards looking at holistic solutions to deal with the challenge of conflict, of poverty, and of underdevelopment. We need to link hands not only with the communities on the ground, but with those who are extracting our minerals and also with the countries to which these minerals go to the destination countries. So we need greater transparency. Uh, we need greater commitment to peace, to the protection of women and children, and to looking at the root causes that propel these conflicts. It's important for us to break this connection between illegal exploitation of, of resources and the proliferation of small arms and light weapons in our region. I feel quite hopeful for our region because I think our countries have begun to realize the huge potential that the Great Lakes region has for the transformation of our continent and also for the transformation of our world. We are so well endowed with minerals. We are so well endowed with biodiversity. Uh, we are so well endowed with rivers, with lakes. If you open up the Great Lakes region, you open up the world. And this is the direction that we want to go. And this is why it's so important for us to address this problem of the illegal exploitation of our natural resources so that they can be used to uplift our people and to take the direction of our development along a positive trajectory. I thank you. This afternoon, the Council will be discussing North Korea. Can I ask you what is Kenya's position about the North Korean uh, missile tests and the, the no latest North Korean actions? Does t Kenya believe the Council now needs to take firm action? Well, um, my um, um, PR, who is in charge of this matter, will address you on it um, after the meeting has been held. Let me not preempt him uh, in the statement that he may wish to make after this. I thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The UN Environment Programme today released its Production Gap Report, which found that despite increased climate ambitions and net zero commitments, governments still plan to produce more than double the amount of fossil fuels in, tw in 2030 than what would be consistent with glo limited glo limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Over the next two decades, governments are collectively projecting an increase in global oil and gas project production and only a modest decrease in coal production. The report also shows that countries have directed over $300 billion in new funds towards fossil fuel activities since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, more than they have towards clean energy. The Secretary General said that the report shows that there is still a long way to go to a clean energy future. He added that it is urgent that all remaining public financiers, as well as private finance, including commercial banks and asset managers, switch their funding from coal to renewables to promote full decarbonization of the power sector and access to renewable energy for all. You can find the full report online. At a Security Council meeting on the situation in the Great Lakes region, the Secretary General Special Envoy, Wang Xia, said that the region is at a crossroads. He reiterated that the main threat to peace and stability remains the persistence of armed groups. But Mr. Shah added bilateral and regional initiatives attest to the awareness of the added value of dialogue and cooperation. More than ever, he said, it is necessary to consolidate these gains. Turning to COVID-19, he said the pandemic has exacerbated vulnerabilities, but also demonstrated the resilience of societies in the region. He reiterated the Secretary General's call for greater solidarity to facilitate access to vaccines and to strengthen existing health systems and structures. Martha Ama Akia Bobe, the Assistant Secretary General for Africa in the Departments of Political and Peacebuilding Affairs and Peace Operations also spoke to council members. This afternoon, the Security Council will have a meeting on Somalia, followed by consultations on Lebanon. And speaking of Somalia, our humanitarian colleagues say that climate shocks are worsening the situation in the country, which is bracing for a third consecutive below-average rainy season. As a result, 
the November cereal harvest in the northwest of Somalia is projected to be 63% below the average levels in the past decade. More than 250,000 people are facing severe water shortages, half of them in Jubaland state. There's also a reduction in pasture for livestock, affecting vulnerable people's food security and nutrition. Without humanitarian assistance, nearly 3.5 million people across Somalia will face crisis or worse levels of food insecurity by the end of the year. Some 1.2 million children under the age of five are also likely to be acutely malnourished. Of these, more than 213,000 are projected to be severely malnourished. Water, food, and health assistance are the most urgent humanitarian needs, according to our partners on the ground. Humanitarian organizations are trucking water, providing cash vouchers, and delivering nutrition supplies to people in need. They are, however, significantly constrained by the lowest levels of funding in five years. Somalia's 2021 humanitarian response plan is only 50% funded. On Ethiopia, our humanitarian colleagues are alarmed by the escalating conflict in the north, especially following reports of the impact on civilians, including after an airstrike in Mekele, in Tigray today. Initial information from the ground indicates that civilians, including women and children, were injured. We're trying to gather more information. More than 5.2 million people across Tigray, that's more than 90% of the region's population, need life-saving assistance, including nearly 400,000 people facing famine-like conditions. We repeat our call to all parties to the conflict to de-escalate across Tigray, Amhara, and Afar to avoid further casualties and the suffering of civilians. Humanitarian needs are also increasing in Amhara and Afar due to the spillover into these regions of the conflict in Tigray. All parties to the conflict must always uphold international humanitarian law and ensure the protection of civilians and civilian infrastructure. Just an update on UN operations, some 30% of all our staff in Ethiopia are in different regions of the country, including Tigray. The UN and humanitarian partners are staying and delivering. For safety measures, a small proportion of the UN team has been relocated, and that's around 100 UN staff and 17 dependents. We currently have nearly 400 staff in Tigray alone, committed to delivering life-saving needs to the most vulnerable people. Including national and and international NGOs, that number is nearly 2,000 people in the region. Across the country, our team on the ground notes multiple safety issues that are sparking an increasing number of internally displaced people who urgently need humanitarian assistance. Turning to Syria, we're deeply concerned about ongoing and increasing hostilities in recent months in the northwest and the impact that this is having on civilians. Yesterday, artillery shelling was reported in Idlib. One civilian was killed and four others injured. Artillery shelling was also reported in other parts of Idlib and in western Aleppo. Today, several civilian casualties have been reported following artillery shelling in Ariha town, south of the city of Idlib. The recent escalation is the most significant increase in hostilities in northwest Syria since the ceasefire agreement of March 2020. The UN condemns all violence in Syria. We remind all parties to the conflict to respect international humanitarian law, including the prohibition of indiscriminate attacks and the obligation to take all feasible precautions to avoid and minimize harm to civilians and civilian infrastructure. And I have a COVID-19 update for you today from Cabo Verde with the UN team led by resident coordinator Ana Grasa, continues to help authorities to address the health and socioeconomic impacts of the pandemic. As of today, nearly 80% of people over the age of 18 have received at least the first dose of the COVID-19 vaccine, and nearly half of them have been fully vaccinated. UN agencies have provided strategic support for the national vaccination campaign. Cabo Verde has received more than 700,000 vaccine doses, both through COVAX and bilaterally, and this is enough to vaccinate nearly all eligible people. The UN team is also supporting health facilities, helping students with distance learning, and providing meals for children, among other assistance. The Food and Agriculture Organization today launched the Global Map of Salt-Affected Soils, a key tool for halting salinization and boosting productivity. FAO said that the map, a joint project involving 118 countries and hundreds of data crunchers, will allow experts to identify where sustainable soil management practices should be adopted to prevent salinization and sodification and to manage salt-affected soils sustainably. FAO noted that the map can inform policymakers when dealing with climate change adaptation and irrigation projects. 
As for press encounters, beyond our guests and also Monica Grayley, who will uh, be speaking to you at, after I'm done, uh, Ambassador Rachel Awar Omamu, the Cabinet Secretary for Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Kenya, will brief reporters at the Security Council stakeout following the Council's meeting on the situation in the Great Lakes region. Then this afternoon at around 4 p.m., Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield, representative of the United States of America, will brief reporters on the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, also at the Security Council. And finally, tomorrow our guest will be Christine Shana Bergener, the Secretary General's Special Envoy on Myanmar, and she will be here in this room to brief you on the situation in Myanmar. Yes, turning to questions, Michelle. Thanks, Farhan. Um, just wanted to follow up on what you were saying on Ethiopia. Um, just to clarify, you're, you were talking about the airstrike today um, and that the initial information from UN people on the ground. Can you just clarify what and how many people you think might be injured? Uh, well, like I said, we, we don't have, at this point, we don't have um, the, the casualty figures, but the initial information indicates that some civilians, including women and children, were injured. We don't have numbers, but we're trying to get more information on that. And what's, what's the Secretary General's um, reaction to this? Has he spoken with the Prime Minister? Well, he's made clear his concerns, uh, in, including in recent days, uh, and, those, and those concerns continue. He hasn't spoken uh, to him, uh, to the Prime Minister today, but we have made clear what our concerns are about the impact of these operations on civilians and the need to avoid uh, any uh, offensive ac uh, uh, activities that, uh, that can target civilians or civilian infrastructure. Yes, Edie. Thank you, Farhan. Uh, two questions. First, does the Secretary General have any comment on the uh, bombings in Syria today? Yes. Um, what I can say about that is, of course, first of all, we've been deeply concerned about the ongoing and increasing hostilities uh, throughout the country and, and, uh, and the impact that that's been having on, on civilians. I just mentioned uh, our concerns about the artillery shelling that happened uh, in uh, uh, south of the city of Idlib. But separately, we are also following with concern reports of a military bus coming under attack in Damascus earlier this morning in an attack that kills scores of people. Uh, the UN strongly condemns all violence in Syria, and as always, we urge all parties and those with influence over them to ensure the protection of civilians and civilian infrastructure at all times, and that includes schools, markets, and health facilities. My Thank you. My second question is about talks uh, being hosted by Russia between representatives of the Taliban and neighboring countries today. Um, is the UN involved in any way in um, observing, monitoring those talks? We've not been involved in this in this latest round of talks, but we'll uh, but we'll be in touch with uh, the various. Uh, partners who have been uh, working uh, to get uh, uh, the talks going and see what information we can get. But at this stage, uh, what we're encouraging is is to see whether uh, there can be uh, more of an effort by countries, both in the region and uh, and more generally throughout, uh, to uh, to work uh, to ensure that uh, that. Uh, the situation in Afghanistan remains peaceful and, and the basic rights of all Afghans are upheld. Yes. Yes, Farhan. Uh, just back to Ethiopia. You are uh, using the word airstrike today rather than reported airstrike. Um, so that, I su suspect, with today's event, you confirming it's an airstrike. Can you also confirm that the two previous airstrikes, this reported airstrikes from the... U the, the UN believes that the damage there is consistent with an airstrike. And given these three airstrikes in the last few days uh, on Mekele, um, in terms of what is being hit by these airstrikes, do you in any way see that these could be deemed legitimate military targets? Uh, it's, it's not for me to determine whether something is a legitimate military target. We, from our standpoint, have raised concerns about any attacks that disproportionately harm civilians. Uh, and, uh, and beyond that, of course, we would need to, to gain further information about why 
the the targets were chosen the, the way they were. I, I believe in the in the earlier cases uh, there there have even been uh, a, a, an admission from uh, from the relevant authorities that that they were airstrikes. So I have nothing further to say on on it than that. Uh, and just going back to it's now nearly two weeks since the Secretary General was in the Security Council um, on this issue, and pushed very hard the Ethiopian permanent representative. Have you had any further? contact from the Ethiopians to justify the expulsion of the UN officials? We, we have no formal communication of that, that, would, that would provide uh, the sort of reasoning. That the, in other words, the information that the Secretary General has asked for, we have not received, no. Uh, yes, uh, 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 Alan and then Carla. Alan first. Thank you, Farhan. Uh, regarding the, the, uh, the question of the meeting uh, on Afghanistan in Moscow, the so-called Moscow format. Uh, the participants called, called uh, for um, donor co conducting, convening a donor conference uh, by the UN to help the Afghanistan uh, to recover from this crisis. Any comments on this proposal of the participants of the Moscow format meeting? Thank you. Well, certainly the United Nations is always willing to to do what it can to raise funds uh, for the support of the people of Afghanistan. I don't have any announcement uh, to make at this point about a donor conference, but uh, but we're aware of uh, the the calls and we'll see what uh, what can be arranged. Yes, in the back. Thank you, Vohan. You mentioned that the U.S. ambassador will be briefing on the DPRK at the Security Council, or did you mean? It, uh, at the Security Council stakeout, or would it be in this room? Uh, at the, I said uh, at the Security Council stakeout, so that's where she'll be. Does Canada's Garage have licensed technicians? Trust Canada's Garage for brakes, tires, and everything in between. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Adrian Dix. I'm BC's Minister of Health. To my right is Dr. Bonnie Henry, BC's Provincial Health Officer. It's our COVID-19 briefing, weekly briefing for Tuesday, October the 19th, 2021. We're honoured to be here on the territories of the Lekwungen-speaking people of the Songhees and the Esquimalt First Nations. Uh, Dr. Henry has a presentation to make with respect to uh, COVID-19 in BC and a situation report on K-12 schools. And uh, I'll be back to report on some of our regular, my regular weekly items as well. Uh, with that, it's my honor to introduce Dr. Bonnie Henry. Thank you very much and good afternoon. So we're here uh, this afternoon to share the latest updates on our COVID-19 public health response and I want to start by uh, uh, just acknowledging as you might have seen earlier today I announced changes to the provincial health officer order which lifts the capacity limits at some of the organized events and gatherings um, with the implementation of the vaccination card and the uh, checking of full vaccine status. So effective October 25th, one day after the full vaccine requirement comes into effect, we'll be able to increase to 100 capacity at indoor sporting events, indoor concerts, theaters, uh, movie theaters, dance and symphony events, and some of the, the great arts and sports that we've been missing, as well as uh, indoor organized events such as weddings, uh, uh, funeral receptions and and parties I will um, as well we're going to be lifting that restriction the, the requirement that everybody be seated at restaurants and pubs to allow a little bit more uh, freedom of movement with the uh, fact that everybody in those situations will be fully vaccinated um, I will remind people of course that the uh, other public health restrictions remain in place including the indoor mask requirement when you're moving about and uh, these changes are applicable where proof of vaccine status is being checked and also where there are no regional health orders in place and as you know uh, we've been monitoring that one of our greatest uh, problems with um our, within our society is inequity and inequality and we do need to be careful to listen to all sides and we need to make sure that 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 we find the right balance so that people are supported 
overall and one side isn't just grabbing the upper hand over over the other when we look at our different um, problems around the world especially um, when it comes to inequality we it becomes apparent well with things like the pandemic where we see that certain countries are approaching 90 percent vaccination rates such as Canada which has achieved um, 90 percent vaccination in the US who also has achieved uh, close to 90 percent vaccination in a lot of European countries that have also achieved it when we look at other countries that are in um, in Africa and developing and in South America that are also uh, developing and don't have as many resources and uh, financial resources to to purchase the the vaccinations or to, to get to get doctors in there to help vaccinate uh, different regions of their countries that we start to see the inequalities and we start to understand where poverty is actually coming from poverty is a result of that inequality and we need to ensure that all sides are listened to all sides get help and that we find the right balance so that people feel supported and people are finding the help that they need so that they can live better. So, we want to thank you for listening today to Policy and Rights. Of course, this is Depictions Media, and I am the host, Michael Clocks. Thank you for listening today and thank you for supporting us with our sponsors. Please go to depictions.media for more information and click on our contact link and let us know how we can help. How we can help bring your story and help bring us to a better world. This show has been produced by Depictions Media. Please contact us at depictions.media for more information.